Breaking it all down, I'm Count Zero. Well, this week I'm taking a look at another video game, Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception for the PlayStation 3. Because this game is less than a year old, I'm going to not give a full plot synopsis on this one. I'll probably do a full rundown of the first and second games of the series a little bit later. Anyway, without further ado, let's get started. In this game, like the earlier titles in the series, we follow explorer Nathan Drake as he looks for the lost city of Iram of the Pillars. This time, Nathan and his friends are going up against Catherine Marlowe, the head of a secret society founded to spy for the British government during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, but over the years has now become more out for themselves. For those who aren't familiar with it, according to the Quran, Iram of the Pillars was a city that was destroyed by God by having it be consumed by the desert due to the decadence and wicked ways of the people who lived there. Other versions of the story have it that there was a urn full of djinn that, were, that was trapped by King Solomon and then placed at the depths of Iram. And that in turn also led to the city's destruction to make sure that those djinn could never ever be released. More likely though, the real Aram was a major hub for the frankincense trade across what is now the Rubal Qadi Desert. And at the time of its height, there would have been oases allowing for caravan routes across the desert for this trade to take place. As des desertification caused those um, oases to disappear, the caravan routes literally dried up, and thus consequently the city would likely have had to have been abandoned or otherwise the people who live there would have died of thirst and starvation and all other sorts of unpleasant, nasty, nasty things. And thus, with that, the city itself would have been buried underneath the shifting sands of the desert, in the same way that after the fall of the Mayan Empire, the cities of that empire were consumed by the jungle. If you're familiar with the Uncharted series, you all should have a general idea about how the gameplay works. You will have traversal sequences through various environments where you try to get from point A to point B by climbing up various ruins and that sort of thing to reach puzzles and solve the puzzles and all that sort of stuff. And then after that, you get to do gunfight sequences where you face off against large numbers of enemies who are trying to kill you and you shoot them and take them out and so forth and so on, your standard video game combat kind of thing. The traversal controls are basically identical to the way they were in Uncharted 2, which is fine. It worked. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The combat, on the other hand, has received some significant adjustments, particularly due to the game's melee combat. In earlier games, you just mash the melee button to beat the crap out of your enemies, or they tap the melee button to beat the crap out of you. Here, what we have now is a sort of quick time event thing. You go up to an enemy, you tap your melee attack button, and a quick time event sequence happens where you tap some buttons that are prompted on screen to take out your enemy. On the same token, if the enemy attacks you, then you get a quick time event to counter their attack, so you can then get an attack in on them or take them out or whatever you choose to do. This is a real improvement to the melee combat as it appears in the other games in the series, where Basically, if enemies got in a melee with you, you were hosed. If you got in a melee with enemies, you were might win, but you weren't going to necessarily do well all the time. Um, the problem is with these sequences is that, frankly, you take damage during these sequences if other people are shooting at you. So you could very easily go into a QTE with an enemy, have another have another enemy come up behind you and start shooting at you. And by the time you've taken out your opponent and are going to turn around to shoot the other guy, you're dead. So, you do need to be careful how you use the melee combat in here. 
the otherwise the shooting controls were adjusted, but they also have the option there to use the old shooting controls if you don't like the new ones. I tried this game using the old shooting controls. Honestly, it's up to your preference. Choose whatever one you want, and if you don't like the new controls, you can go back to the old ones or vice versa. The multiplayer mode from the last game is still present, and along with a co-op mode, which is basically an expanded version of the last game's co-op. I didn't play those, though, so I'm not going to get too far into those. The story itself is excellently written, with a great deal of character growth for everyone from the earlier titles, and with some amazing set pieces. There's also the fantastic desert sequence, which has been included slightly in the various teaser trailers for the game, but has not been shown in depth, and which I am definitely not going to show here. It is something that really needs to be seen and experienced to be truly savor and savored and enjoyed. It is impressive, it is definitely worth watching, and heck, I might even call this sequence worth the price of getting the game, at least renting the game, on its own. So, Uncharted 3 Drake's Deception is beyond a doubt definitely worth your time and money. It is an excellent game with an excellent story, and certainly one of the best games of last year. And that was really short. Um, that was a really short episode. I need to make up for that. So, um, uh, the Hugo Award nominees were allowed, announced just this past week. So, how about I talk about those? I'll go over the nominees for Best Novel today, and then in future episodes, whenever I'm, well, running short, I will go over the other batches of nominees in different categories. So, let's get started with the novels. There are surprisingly several fantasy novels in the best novels category this year. Honestly, I'm not the biggest fan of putting fantasy, well, books in the Hugo Awards because the Hugo Awards, they're science fiction. There are awards like the World Fantasy Awards for, well, fantasy, and I feel they fit in, that would fit in better over there. And this is nitpicking on my part, but honestly, it's... I would rather that a newer science fiction novel get the recognition for best science fiction rather than putting a fantasy novel in there just because it's sold well or it's really popular. This brings me to the latest novel in the Game of Thrones series, uh, Dance with Dragons, being nominated here. And this is a series where it is definitely fantasy. There are no science fiction elements here. It's not that any magic here is sufficiently advanced technology or anything like that. It is all fantasy all the time. I mean, I don't know if this was a bad year for science fiction novels or something, but there had to be something else to put... There, there just would have to be something else to put in the spot rather than just this. Something. Anything. Just pick something else. Um, I mean... You can have fantasy with science fiction elements. Jack Vance's Dying Earth series is post-apocalyptic, and The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, which I reviewed earlier, and which was nominated last year, kind of split the difference, where this was fantasy, but they didn't explain it, and there was the distinct possibility that the magic of the setting was in fact actually sufficiently advanced technology. They didn't explain, but they didn't need to. It kept things interesting. The other fantasy novel here that's been nominated is Among Others by Joe Walton. And this one's a little weirder in the sense that it's sort of urban fantasy-ish, but the plot involves science fiction fandom. So I'm going to be on the fence on this. This book is on my to-read list. And I will check this out, try to get it to it before the Hugo Awards this time. But we'll see how heavily fantasy this is, or if there is enough science fiction here to make me feel, okay, this fits. So outside of that, the other three books out of the five for this year's category are more solidly science fiction, but two of them aren't my cup of tea. First is Embassy, Down, Embassy Town by China Mivali. I can never pronounce his name right. Mivali and I kind of have, I don't want to say a love-hate relationship, but Mivali is very, very good at crafting well-written, 
characters who you really empathize with and you like and you come to love and then Mivoli takes those characters and carefully slowly deliberately beats them to death until as a reader you're crying out well Stop! Stop! he's already dead now if that's executed well and with Mivoli it generally is then you can still have a book that's enjoyable to read but for me as a reader I have to be in the right mindset for those sequences and for those books I have to be in a case where well, I am emotionally, mentally ready, and have prepared myself to be punched in the gut repeatedly. And, well, admittedly, I'm not like that, not in that position often. And when it happens, I'm not that in that mindset for long. So for stories which execute this kind of thing well, it tends to work better for television or film or that sort of thing, as opposed to a book where... I'm going to be reading it over several days. It's going to take me a few days to read it and savor it and enjoy it properly. So consequently, that kind of, well, care, um, emotional dissection doesn't work for me very well. So honestly, Mevely, while I respect him as a writer, he is not my cup of tea. Um, the other book, which falls into the I'm not into you category, is Deadline by Mira Grant. The latest book of her blogger during the zombie apocalypse series. Her earlier book, um, uh, Feed, was nominated last year. And again, this is a case where I didn't read it. It's zombies. Zombies aren't my thing. I, I'll go in for a Resident Evil game and shoot some zombies in the head and maybe play some um, Left 4 Dead. But that's basically the most of my zombie stuff that I'm into anymore. I'm just kind of done, pretty much, with zombies. Nothing personal against Mira Grant. Um, if she writes something that doesn't have zombies in it, I will read it, and I may enjoy it. But as far as the Feed series goes, I'm out. This leaves Aviathan Wakes by James S. A. Corey, which is also in my to-read list. In fact, it was entered on my to-read list as soon as the book basically came out. It is a more solar system centric science fiction novel and it's much more well, space travel focused which is something which when I came into science fiction it was for I was here for the spaceships kind of thing and this is getting into that so I am definitely definitely kind of pushing for this book a bit and I am going to get to it as soon as I can and that covers it for this week for my various reviews and that sort of thing um, next week, I'm going to review a book. Another one. Well, let's keep in with tune with the Hugo Awards thing and science fiction. I'll be taking a look at They Shall Have Stars by Hugo Award winning science fiction author James Blish. And we'll be kicking it old school this time because this book was written in the 1950s. Um, and if the, this one, again, runs short, I'll take a look at some more Hugo Award nominee stuff. Let's go with, oh the visual things. Um, best long form cinematic presentation, best short form, so the television and the movies. And so until next time, thanks for watching.